Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. If you were living under a brutal authoritarian regime, how would you change things? Would you rally your fellow citizens to take up arms against the tyrant? Or would you use nonviolent civil resistance? I'm willing to bet you already have a strong feeling about which way you would go. But what if I told you that according to historical data, the most likely way to make meaningful change is through nonviolent resistance? You might not believe me, but I sat down with a man who wants to convince you otherwise, Dr. Peter Ackerman, founder of the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. Nonviolent conflict? Sounds like an oxymoron, but his organization has advised dissidents in dozens of countries on how to create lasting regime change without using violence. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Ackerman. So why nonviolent resistance? Why totalitarian rule? It's a response to totalitarian rule, mm -hmm. to the kind of rule that people feel oppressed under, that makes their lives miserable, that puts them under the threat of death, pestilence, bad education, injustice, all the horribles that, that one could think of for humanity correlate with tyrannical rule. And one of the responses to tyrannical rule that I believe has been effective for decades, if not millennia, is civil resistance or nonviolent resistance or people power when understood and used uh, with these most strategically sound methods. But can nonviolent resistance really stand up to a bloodthirsty dictator? Remember, a bloodthirsty dictator can't shoot everybody with his own gun. He can try. Yeah, but even he doesn't try. What he can, what he must do is he must have people who'll do it for him. Even Hitler had people who had to do it for him. So he has to muster an army, a police, and not all these, these uh, organizations are, uh, remain loyal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the more bloodthirsty you are, the more brittle you are because the bloodthirstiness carries over to your own military. Remember the head of, the, the, the newest head of North Korea took his uncle and put him on a fence post and shot him with an artillery round in front of the uh, cadets on graduation day, as I understand the story. And look at how solid true Korea is. Yeah, it's, it's as stable as you can imagine. Um, well, so like, the American Revolution was a violent revolution, and America is the greatest country on earth. So how can nonviolent revolution be better than violent revolution? Well, there were important nonviolent tactics used, like the Tea Party. Boston Tea Party is a nonviolent tactic. Um, no one is saying, we, we can't be absolute. Mm -hmm. No one is saying that violent tactics linked into a strategy can't be effective. It was against the British, but there were also factors that were not military in character that also, uh, that also um, impacted the outcome. An occupation is a difficult thing from across an ocean. Now, we have done a study of um, 323 insurrections between, between 1900 and 2006. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> there, they were divided into two kinds of insurrections, those dominated by violent tactics, guerrilla warfare, mm -hmm. insurrection, terrorism, whatever you might want to think of, and those that are dominated by tactics that maintain nonviolent discipline, strikes, boycotts, mass protests. There's hundreds of them, mm -hmm. um, bank holidays, uh, 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 consumer boycotts. I, I, Where people uh, stop supporting the system. It, or disrupt the system. Disruption. And what we found was that of the two-thirds that were dominated by violent tactics, based on their own goals as articulated, they reached their goals 26% of the time. Mm -hmm. But with respect to campaigns of civil resistance or people power movements, those goals articulated by them will reach 53% of the time. And the transfer of power that occurred um, was 10 times more likely to be democratic after a civil resistance movement than a violent insurrection. So you're saying nonviolent resistance is actually a more effective means at achieving democracy? That data would suggest just that. Wow. People like to use the term nonviolence and confuse it with nonviolent conflict. And when you think about nonviolence, you think about people who are there to basically convince you of the error of your ways, 
to sit cross-legged with incense and say, beat me until you basically have sympathy of my views so you'll change your ways. And it, it has a component that's very moral in its impetus, which is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't overthrow dictators because I've yet to meet a dictator or hear about one when he's asked to give up some of his power, he's, he says back, well, would Tuesday be soon enough? <laughs> they don't give their power up, it has to be taken. So nonviolent conflict is the act of disruption that leads to defections that undermines the legitimacy of a, um, of a dictator or an authoritarian. So you're saying this is an aggressive form of nonviolent conflict? No, all nonviolent conflict is aggressive. Uh -huh. It, that, it's just that nonviolence, which is peaceful, tranquil, has nothing to do. Mm -hmm. It's not a strategy. It's a mora morality. It's a fine morality. Now, one of the things that confuses people is that, well, what about Gandhi and King? Mm -hmm. Well, they both were committed pacifists. True. But nobody cares mm -hmm. about, we care about uh, Gandhi if in 1930 he didn't leave his ashram, walk 210 miles to Dandi Beach, pick up a handful of mud, throw it into a pot of boiling water, turn it into salt, which was illegal to make, and have 250 million people follow him, do the same thing, and then read from the Viceroy of India that if this disruption continues and the local constabularies around India, only 100,000 basically defect, we're going to have to leave. So this is basically a targeted strategy of regime change. Power shifting. It may lead to regime change or it may lead to a, a, new, a new mode of of coexistence between the tyrant and the, uh, and the opposition, but it's a power shifting, a dramatic power shifting to restore human rights, to restore um, uh, justice, liberty, property rights, the things that basically advanced societies have relied on and enjoy. So what are some of the tactics that you encourage um, dissenting groups around the world to use? Well, we don't give advice about what tactics to use, but we, unfold, we, we try to make them understand that, the, that there's a tremendous variety of tactics. So let's take, in Poland, it was the Gdansk shipyard strike. In South Africa, it was the, it was the boycott in Port Elizabeth. In, um, in India, it was the salt march. Uh, we did the story of the Nashville lunch counter boycott in the civil rights movement. In Chile, it was a referenda that undid po Pinochet. He thought he was going to win. He didn't. He told the military, please, let's forget we ever had a referendum. The military says, you're done. Remember? I do. He wants to shoot them. They won't shoot. He's in big trouble. In, uh, in uh, Ukraine, it was a protest in the Maidan for a month that basically led to a military defection. In, uh, in Egypt, which is, I think, in, yet to be successful, we had Tahrir Square, which was that, that eruption. Well, so let's shift over to China. I know you... Um... And then, of course, Tiananmen in China. That didn't exactly go so well. Now, when you say it didn't go well, mm -hmm. that tactic alone didn't get the job done. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between tactics and strategy. A strategy that works is when you knit a series of tactics together. Mm -hmm. So it went very well if you measure the tactic in, in terms of successfully disrupting the status quo. Mm -hmm. It certainly did that. The question wasn't about that tactic, but what would come next. And the only way you know what comes next is if you're trained to think about how to link tactics into a strategy. And that's what the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict does. Our site is very rich. You know, we, um, uh, we help dissidents around the world. We don't tell people who we're helping, but we've now helped probably dissidents in 70 countries over the last 15 years. And um, that's what we do. It's a coaching mechanism to make people think strategically about the uh, about the campaign of civil resistance. So how do you coach that? Because uh, in the Tiananmen protests, as well as many other grassroots movements around the world, uh, the question is always, who is in charge? Who is making these decisions? And that often kind of, sh they end up shooting themselves in the foot. Well, there's a lot of different ideas. First of all, who's shooting who in the foot in a nonviolent conflict? Well, themselves. Did and they it's shoot a them? Or, right? Yeah, it's a metaphor. Okay. But th there's, a lot of, there's a lot there that needs to be impacted. A nonviolent resistance movement done badly, people will shoot themselves in the foot, but they won't shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, they might shoot themselves in the foot, but it might hit the little toe. A violent insurrection that screws up, they shoot themselves in the head. There's no coming back from it. We have data to show that a civil resistance movement that even is not successful lays the seeds potentially for another one four or five 
six years later, and that's exactly what's happening in Iran today. Or like in Hong Kong, where they had the umbrella movement in 2014, and even though that did not necessarily achieve all of their goals, that movement is still alive. Exactly. In a country like China, how can the population that is uh, under so much propaganda, uh, the Communist Party has a th this thing called patriotic education, where from a young age, people are taught uh, that the party is there for them, that they have to love the party, that the party is China. In an environment like that, how can people uh, decide to begin a nonviolent uh, resistance movement? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's answer this by referring to Natan Sharansky, who was the great refusenik in the Soviet Union where that ideological in indoctrination was just as intense. And he asked a very interesting question. How was it that the people in the gulags, the people who basically were under the most pressure, mm -hmm. uh, lived the most wretched lives, were able to predict the end of the Soviet Union where all the intelligence agencies in the world and all the smart people who are Russian experts couldn't? Because they knew something that's profoundly true, that in every authoritarian regime, there's four kinds of people. There's the population that's apathetic and just doing nothing. Then there's the part of the population that's willing to dissent. Then they're in opposition to the third group, which is the true believer, who basically is at the very top and believes the ideology, whatever ridiculous justification they may have for treat, mistreating people the way they do. And then you have the latent double thinker, who's like, who's a normal human being, who hates to see the collateral damage of what the true believers are trying to inculcate. They so, become disillusioned. That's exactly, double thinkers are the subject of dis disillusionment, exactly, perfectly expressed. So the strategy is for the uh, activists to convert the double thinkers or make them go from latent to active. Yes, now China, uh, we know there's lots of double thinkers and they're latent. Mm -hmm. The question is how do they, um, how do they uh, take action? Well, first, how do they expose themselves safely to find mm -hmm. other double thinkers mm -hmm. and then take action? Mm -hmm. The disruption, like I told you in India, and I don't think there's 250 million people you know, saying before that, I'm, I want the Raj over. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the guy made salt, it was easy for people to say that that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. So people need to see that they can win. They can win, or more importantly, is that they can express their double thinking without fear of terrible reprisals. They're always afraid of being the one head that's above the other and that gets chopped off. One of the tactics I know you talk about is signage. What do you mean by signage? Well, one of the questions we've been, I've been asked all the time is, well, won't the internet make all this right? And the answer is it may or may not. Um, the internet is interesting in terms of its ability to distribute information individual to individual, but it's also a problem because it basically allows people to be tracked individual to individual. So you can have granularity communication and granularity tracking. And the Chinese Communist Party is especially good at using so social I'm told. media. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the one thing that's interesting that I've been trying to tell people to think about is stop, stop this obsession with the internet because the internet is great, but it's also a choke point. Mm -hmm. Unless they're watching this show, in which case they should still be on the internet. Well, then, then you're clogging the artery that's been clogged, and, got, and thank you for doing that. But the one thing, people, people have to go outside, there have to be buildings, mm -hmm. and signs, lots and lots of signs expressing dissent, mm -hmm. uh, have a virtue of being out there. They, they show that people are not in control, that they claim to be, they can offer directions. They can interact with the internet, you know, click here. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done nearly enough technologically to make sign making instantaneous and hard to track as to who's doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say on the internet, go here, like, like in Twitter Square, everybody thought it was a Facebook revolution because people always in, you know, re refer to things based on what they're experiencing at the moment and, and Facebook was taking off. But the fact is that 6% of the population only were internet savvy, internet connected, mm -hmm. and uh, the internet was shut off before Tahrir Square, but you know, we don't want to get into those facts. But, but it may be a choke point 
but it may be um, an addendum to something, a form of communication that's not a choke, choke point, but becomes a magnifier to something that already exists. And that's what signage can be. So I wonder if this would count. Um, one of the largest groups of nonviolent resistors in China right now is uh, practitioners of Falun Gong. I know one of the tactics they use is to uh, write messages on Chinese money and pass that around. Same idea. So what can groups like that in China do to affect change? Well, if we're talking about the, the logistical support of nonviolent tactics through signage, mm -hmm. one of the things we also have to realize is that Facebook is not a strategy. You've got goals, you've got tactics, boycott strikes, and then you have a strategy that knits them together, and then you have logistics that support a strategy. Facebook is a communications logistics. It's all, that's, it's nothing more than that. We get enamored with Facebook and think it's secure for everything, but it's just a logistical tool. And we need to understand that. Then we say, well, what other logistical tools can achieve the same things? But once you, basically sharpen your logistical tools, your knives, for the tactics you're going to use, that's all they're useful. Then there's the selection of tactics. And, that, and the selection of tactics is far more important because the disruption you create uh, will lead to a certain level of repression that might lead to obedience or may lead to a certain level of disruption that may lead to defection. So the authoritarian regime wants to have as much obedience with as little repression as possible. Of course. And the, um, the non-violent civil, civil, civil resistors mm -hmm. want to have as much defection with the least amount of disruption. Interesting. So that's where the competition is. Mm -hmm. Because if you have too much disruption and too little defection, the public will become apathetic. Mm -hmm. If you have too little obedience with too much repression, the repression will backfire and then, the, then, the, the, then, the, authority, then the authoritarian has lost his main tool. So when you think of tactics, nonviolent tactics, there are really two forms of nonviolent tactics. Doing things the authoritarian wants you to stop doing, like a protest or a march, and stop doing things they want you to continue to do, which is what you're talking about here. The most important thing I would do is think, well, what else could we do in combination? Because it's the combination of tactics that create a strategy. Tactics on their own is not a strategy and the power is in the combination. So at the end of the day, it's a game of chess between the authoritarian regime and the resistors, right. each using their tactics to try and defeat the other. Each using their tactics to create the, the, the best strategy. And what, what the authoritarian is most worried about is that the opposition will actually have a strategy because what they want to do is disrupt that possibility. That's their best so they want to basically make sure nobody unifies. They want to make sure that nobody, uh, nobody's talking about different ways to disrupt. They, they want to make sure nobody's planning. planning you know, Eisenhower said that uh, plans are, are useless, but planning is everything. Mm -hmm. the, the ability to constantly think about how to piece together a string of tactics, always thinking about that is very, very powerful. It's like in a, you know, my son's a wrestler. You don't just bull rush an Olympic wrestler. Mm -hmm. You have to basically pull his arm, pull his head, touch his, e touch his knee, and it's called chain wrestling until basically if you do it properly, he'll fall over. Mm -hmm. So you cannot talk about a tactic in isolation. Because, let, me, let me say one thing. A tactic in isolation or a tactic combined with another tactic or a tactic combined with a second tactic, that, that first tactic has completely different outcomes depending on whether you combine who and which you combine them with. And so that's the danger of violent resistance, because it's very easy to just not think, attack. And well, then... yes, and, and well, the, the real danger, why I think violent tactics, violent strategies are generally a loser, mm -hmm. is because the people who start with the guerrilla movement uh, basically start with an inferior military position, and the only way they could write that position, which is a key to their having any hope of success, is to kill enough people on the other side in, amongst the authoritarians. But before that, the people they're killing also are seeking protection, so they will go and basically strengthen a relationship with the authoritarian for protection. They won't want to defect. And so they won't want to defect. And so I think they work, a violent insurrection tends to work against itself, and that's why the data has shown very low incidences of success. Do you think we'll see a nonviolent resistance movement taking down the Chinese Communist Party? I don't know what taking down means. 
I know that a violent insurrection will never have a, a meaningful impact. I think it's a loser. But remember, the point of taking, taking down is a, uh, a loaded phrase. Mm -hmm. Do I think that over time a nonviolent resistance movement is likely to create a complete new compact of power between those at the top and citizens? I think there's a good chance of that. Whether it means regime change or it comes in a different form mm -hmm. where you know, the current practices are embedded with other democra more democratic practices and individual rights are basically um, uh, protected. I, I can't say what the end game is. I know that civil resistance, if persisted on, is highly likely, over 50% chance, of, um, of creating a better, more democratic end, end game. Um, but we also know that a violent, this is an interesting fact, a violent insurrection takes nine years on average, a civil resistance movement, three years. So if people can plan and persist for three years, there'll be a change. And, uh, and that's what they need to know. That's what we're in business to tell them. Mm -hmm. And I see what you mean about the importance of language, because taking down implies violence, when really what you want is a conversion. Transfer of power. Mm -hmm. mm, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure being with you. Great. Thanks for watching. Want to see more interviews like this? Leave your comments below about who or what kind of person you'd like to see on China Uncensored next. And remember, you can watch our full half-hour episodes on www.chinauncensored.tv.